Hello, and welcome to Fluidime's FAS Friday session. My name is Lindsay Rapkin, and I'm an imaging mass cytometry FAS supporting customers in the Northeast. I'm based in Toronto. I'm here with my colleague, Connie Inlay, who is a mass cytometry FAS supporting Southern California and the Mountain States. She is based in Orange County, California. We'll be taking your questions in about 10 minutes. Please feel free to enter questions in the question box at any time during the presentation, and we will answer them at the end. First, I'd like to discuss how the use of mass cytometry and imaging mass cytometry enable biomarker discovery. Clinical and translational research is often an iterative process with limited sample access. This means getting the most information possible from each precious sample. The iterative and collaborative nature of clinical and translational research demands consistent and standardized parameter measurements run to run and site to site. Mass cytometry systems can help address all stages of clinical translational research. High dimensional mass cytometry panels are extremely useful for screening at the single cell level in both tissue and cells in suspension. Through this process, cellular biomarkers of disease and therapeutic response, pardon me, and sorry, therapeutic responses can be identified. Once biomarkers are identified, mass cytometry can continue to be used to provide monitoring of a broad range of cell types before, during, and after treatment. It is also possible to further refine and expand your analysis to incorporate biomarker monitoring results. In this paper from Fritz Koning's lab at Leiden University Medical Center, the authors report how they developed a 40 marker panel for high dimensional characterization of cancer immune microenvironments by imaging mass cytometry. This panel for FFPE tissues included immune cell markers to assess tissue residency, lineage, and activation phenotypes. In addition, the panel included surrogates of cancer cell states as well as tissue-specific markers for cellular contextualization within the tissue. The authors also described an optimized workflow for maximum antibody performance as well as providing insight into the antibody validation process. Fluidime joins Fritz Koning and nine other partners across life science and pharma companies as well as academic institutions in the T-cell-driven immune-mediated disease or TIMID consortium. This research is aimed at more precise treatments for immune-mediated diseases using existing therapies and the identification of new targets for drug development. This paper from Bern Bonemiller's lab at the University of Zurich describes the use of imaging mass cytometry for multiplex detection of both mRNA and proteins in tissues. RNA scope-based metal in situ hybridization was used to detect three mRNA target species, along with simultaneous assessment of 16 proteins. 70 breast cancer samples were analyzed. The goal was to investigate single cell and population-based RNA to protein correlations and identify expression associated with T cell abundance. The authors found that as few as six to 14 mRNA copies could be detected. HER2 and cytokeratin-19 mRNA and protein levels were shown to be moderately correlated at the single cell level. However, only HER2, but not cytokeratin-19, had a strong mRNA to protein correlation and the cell, at the cell population level. The chemoattractant CXCL10 was also found to be expressed in stroma and associated with T cell abundance. This slide shows a recent paper from the Annals of Internal Medicine. The authors used an 18-marker imaging mass cytometry panel to enable an unbiased exploratory approach to assess immune infiltration in lung tissue from two patients with COVID-19, one who died of cardiac arrest and one from pneumonia complications. Differences were noted in the immune patterns of infiltrating CD4 and CD8 T cells, NK cells, and macrophages in a single section of lung tissue from each patient. Recruitment of aberrant CD45 RA plus T cells is an immunologic feature of COVID-19. Once bacterial pneumonia occurs, some phagocytes recruited by CD4 T cells begin to play a significant role in lung injury. In this paper from Jim Allison's lab at MD Anderson Cancer Center, distinct cellular responses to combination anti-CTLA4 plus anti-PD1 checkpoint blockade were identified. Mass cytometry was chosen, chosen as the sole method to investigate cellular responses to either dual immunotherapy or monotherapy. Murine tumors and peripheral, peripheral blood from melanoma patients were assessed with 
40 plus marker Cytoff panel. Metaclustering identified 14 tumor infiltrating T cell subsets differing in frequency between mono and dual immunotherapy conditions. Combination therapy and anti CTLA4 therapy, but not anti PD1 therapy, were found to elicit a switch from expansion of exhausted CD8 T cells to an expansion of activated effector CD8 T cells. This paper from Evan Newell's lab at the Singapore Immunology Network used a 52 marker mass cytometry panel to enable comprehensive immune profiling of lung and colon tumor infiltrate. A biomarker was identified that distinguishes tumor epitope reactive versus non-reactive CD8 positive tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Bystander tumor, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are identified by reactivity to common viral epitopes and lack of CD39 expression. The authors also found that the presence of CD39 positive, CD8 positive tumor infiltrating lymphocytes correlated with clinical parameters such as mutation status of lung tumor epidermal growth, lung tumor epidermal growth factor receptors. In this paper from the Wary Lab at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, deep immune profiling by mass cytometry linked features of exhausted T cells to disease progression and response to immunotherapy. A panel of more than 16 exhaustion-related gene products was used to phenotypically characterize CD8 T cells in HIV and lung cancer. Transcriptomic, epigenomic, and proteomic profiling by mass cytometry were integrated to create a multi-parametric exhaustion phenotype of T cells. Finally, in this paper from Evan Newell's lab at Singapore Immunology Network and the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center studied detection, validation, and profiling of antigen-specific T cells using MHC tetramers by Cytoff in human chronic hepatitis B infection. The study utilized three Cytoff panels plus MHC tetramers and enabled the simultaneous analysis of 562 HLAA 1101 restricted epitope candidates in HPV infected patients and normal control participants. The study was able to both identify and phenotypically and functionally characterize these hepatitis B virus specific T cells. Moreover, they were able to show that even though a specific CD8 T cell population subset is responsive to the same antigen, they consist of different subsets linked to disease state, stages. The authors found that HPV core 169 specific CD8 T cells are associated with lung, long-term memory, and polyfunctionality correlated with viral control. These results point toward opportunities for new biomarker development as well as treatment strategies and immunotherapy. Thank you for your attention. We would now be happy to answer your questions. Please enter your questions in the question box and we'll try to get to as many as we can. For those that we can't answer during this webinar, the questions will be forwarded to your regional FAS for follow-up. Thanks, Lindsay. So I see some questions are popping up. Um, so the first one um, is a mass cytometry question for Cytoff. And the question is, how many parameters can I have in one Cytoff panel? <clears throat> so um, to answer this question, so currently we have um, 44 tags that can be used um, for um, antibodies. Um, and then in addition to that, we have additional <clears throat> channels that are dedicated to cell ID. So this would be uh, including the intercalator stain that we use to identify nuclear events. We also have um, an iodine, uh, an IDU um, reagent that helps identify cells that are um, undergoing proliferation. Um, and then in addition to that, we also have um, uh, monoisotopic cisplatins that we recently re released. Um, so cisplatin is used as a viability indicator. Um, and so typically our, our cell ID reagent um, is comprised of natural abundance cisplatin. Um, which can be detected in 194 and 195 channels. But now with the monoisotopic cisplatins, um, those can be uh, used to uh, label antibodies or you can use one isotope to um, use as a viability dye. So uh, we can uh, add additional channels or additional parameters to your panel. So you could have as many as uh, 50, uh, 52 uh, parameters um, in one Cytoff panel. Um, the next question, uh, can the same I antibody be used for IMC as well as Cytoff? 
Um, Lindsay, do you want to take this first? Yep. So the answer to this question is yes and no. Generally speaking, Cytoff antibodies can work in IMC if your sample has been is a frozen sample. Those tend to work better in frozen than they do in FFPE. There are some clones or antibodies, however, that will work in your FFPE tissue, but only about 10% of the catalog that works for Cytoff will work in your FFPE tissue. So this is, if you have a panel and you wanna try it, go ahead. However, it might be better to work with your FAS and use the FFPE specific catalog and design your panel using antibodies that we know will work in your IMC samples right from the start. Great, okay, the next question is another IMC question. Uh, what IMC antibodies are available from Fluidime and for which tissues? Okay, so Fluidime, we have currently about 107 antibodies that are verified by independent pathologists for FFPE and frozen human tissue. That's included on 35 lanthanide metals. And we also have panel kits. So we'll have a panel kit for immune activation, tissue architecture, tumor infiltrating lymph lymphocytes, and an immune oncology panel. The immune oncology kit is an 18 marker panel that leaves room for up to 17 additional metal conjugated antibodies. In addition to our pre-conjugated antibodies, the FAS team can work closely with you to source purified carrier-free antibodies that have pre previously shown to label FFPE and are frozen tissue sections that can be added to your panel as well. And in terms of the tissue part of that question, published IMC studies to date have included immune tissues such as lymph nodes, tonsil, spleen. There's been studies done in kidney, pancreas, liver, brain, spinal cord, gut, and lung. That's in both normal tissues and in various disease states. And those disease states can include lung cancers, um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, and recently from the paper we presented today, um, COVID-19 in the lung. So many different tissues, many different antibodies. Again, the best thing is to contact your FAS and we can work closely with you to design a panel that will work best in your tissue. Great. Um, okay, so the next question is a um, mass cytometry question. How easy is custom conjugation of antibodies and what's the chemistry? So I'll take this one. Um, so the uh, conjugation of antibodies um, can be done in the lab. We sell uh, Maxpar labeling kits um, that come with the polymer, uh, the metal that you wanna conjugate to your antibody and all the uh, uh, um, buffers that you would need um, to conjugate the uh, antibody. Um, the only criteria is that the um, it's a malleamide chemistry, so the polymer interacts with um, the disulfide or the thiol groups. So um, the antibody is partially reduced to uh, free those um, disulfide groups, and then the polymer will interact with those disulfide um, bonds so that the uh, polymer can be uh, labeled to the um, antibody. And it's about a four and a half, five hour protocol. Um, and then after that, you can quantitate your antibody and then store it um, in a stabilizer or buffer at four degrees. Um, okay, so the next question is another mass cytometry question. Are there, um, are there other alternatives for live cell barcoding besides using CD45? Yes, so um, just to describe the barcoding procedure. Um, so barcoding allows you to multiplex samples um, and it's beneficial because it allows you to stain uh, multiple samples as one because you're multiplexing them into one tube. And so for live cell barcoding, typically CD45 antibodies are conjugated to uh, different isotopes so that those individually labeled um, samples can be pulled together in one tube. Um, and so uh, in, in addition to live barcoding with CD45, there are other uh, methods that have been published for live cell barcoding. So there's one example of a paper by Hartman et al. And this uses um, an antibody against CD298 and beta-2 microglobulin. And so those two markers um, basically label, um, uh, is a, it's a universal barcode, so it, they'll label all types of cells, so not just um, immune cell populations that are targeted by CD45. So in this case, you can um, pull together stem cells, you can pull uh, stem cells with um, 
or uh, tumor samples, you can pull your tumor cells along with your um, immune populations. So you're not just restricted to um, immune cells for multiplexing. Um, okay, so for the next question um, is another mass cytometry question. Is data analysis uh, different for CYTOF than regular flow cytometry? So there are some uh, differences, yes. Um, so in flow cyt uh, mass cytometry, there's no um, forward and live uh, scatter. Um, so, and, and in mass cytometry, we use um, an intercalator stain to identify um, cellular events. And so you would need to identify those cells based on their iridium. So iridium is the intercalator that's used to um, label uh, nuclear, or sorry, label cellular events. So in terms of identifying um, cells, you would have to gate on um, iridium positive cells and you would be able to um, differentiate uh, aggregates or uh, debris based on the level of iridium staining. Um, in addition to that, there are other parameters in mass cytometry that uh, don't exist in flow cytometry. So we have another parameter called event length um, that can help identify uh, uh, singlets. Um, we also have um, Gaussian distribution parameters that can also be gated. Um, there's a gating strategy that can be uh, employed to uh, clean up um, dead cells and uh, debris, remove dead cells and debris from the uh, uh, um, FCS files. Um, and then after that, once you've identified your live cells, then you can proceed to um, your clustering algorithms if, you, if you'd like. Um, but generally, if you wanted to do biaxial gating, then you can also um, move forward from your live cell gate and do biaxial gating with the different um, markers that you have. Um, Okay, so the next question, let's see. Um, okay, Lindsay, uh, this question is a follow-up to the previous one about IMC antibodies. Could you please describe the IMC staining protocol and is it complicated? Sure, so the staining protocol for IMC is like that for IF or IHC. The main difference is that rather than using fluorophores, we're using metal conjugated antibodies. The rest of the protocol, however, is quite similar with a rehydration step, an antigen retrieval step, and the staining steps. One advantage with IMC is that not only can you know, imaging mass cytometry enable the analysis of up to 37 markers during staining, they can be stained at once or simultaneously. So this means that the time it takes to stain a few markers is the same it would take to stain a larger, more involved panel. So the simultaneous nature of the staining pro protocol for IMC also means that it's beneficial when we're dealing with prescient, precious patient samples and we don't have a lot of sample to go around. So here you can take all of your antibodies and put them on your sample and stain all at once and it'll limit the amount of samples that you would need. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question for... Um... Uh, Cytoff, do you have recommended panels to examine mouse tumor microenvironment? So, yeah, we um, so we do have um, uh, antibodies against um, uh, markers to look at the mouse tumor microenvironment. In fact, there are um, a number of published papers um, looking into the mouse tumor microenvironment. So, for example, there are papers from Jim Allison's group, um, as well as um, Matt Spitzer has a paper examining mouse tumor microenvironments as well. Um, I would recommend um, reaching out or an FAS can reach out to you so that you can work with um, them, him or her, to create a specific panel, um, you know, specific to your project um, as well. Uh, okay, uh, Lindsay, uh, here's an imaging mass cytometry question for you. Do you require iridium as a DNA stain or does IMC use another method to identify DNA? Okay, so yeah, for IMC, we do recommend using the iridium intercalator as well. And so for our IMC experiments, yeah, we definitely suggest adding that stain after you've included your panel. Um, however, there are alternatives like antibody-based markers that you can use, such as histone H3. And 
a lot of panels will include a nuclear marker such as histone H3 in addition to the DNA intercalator stain. However, we do suggest always including the stain in some tissues or how the tissue is preserved. Not all of the antigens um, may be exposed, so you may not capture every cell with the antibody-based marker. So yes, we use the intercalator DNA stain, and you can use that in addition to a nuclear marker if you so choose. Um, great. Okay, so here's another question for you. Can you use IMC for intracellular markers, phosphoproteins, transcription factors, and so on? Okay, so the answer to that is yes. Intracellular markers such as transcription factors and phosphoproteins can be used in your imaging mass cytometry experiments. And in theory, cytokines can as well, but historically, they're more challenging to visualize in tissues because the signal can be very low. However, in certain disease states where you would have extremely high levels of cytokines, you might be able to detect them depending on how your sample was prepared. Okay. Um, okay. So the next question um, is a mass cytometry question. Are there other methods to identify cells other than intercalar, intercalator staining? Are there methods to discriminate between aggregates and poly, polyploid populations? Um, so we have, um, yeah, so there's, um, you can use uh, cisplatin to identify cells as well. And then in terms of methods to discriminate between aggregates and polyploid populations, um, there is a recent paper by Sean Bendel that describes um, the new morph uh, cell morphometry. Um, and then also uh, in order to uh, look at cell size, there is a paper published a while back using osmium tetraoxide um, where uh, that reagent um, can be used to directly, it interacts with the lipids and so it, it can be used as a cell uh, uh, membrane staining um, and that uh, depending on the size of the cells you could determine whether they were um, uh, the staining intensity is brighter um, than you would be dealing with aggregates or um, larger sizes of um, cell populations. Um, Lindsay could you please provide a little more detail about analyzing IMC data? Sure so the first step when we're imaging our mass cytometry data and what's in our pipeline is to actually look at your images in MCD viewer and make sure that the experiment works, make sure your markers are working and everything looks great. And when you're satisfied with how the experiment performed, you can export your images as single file TIFFs. These TIFFs are then loaded into a software called Cell Profiler. And Cell Profiler is the software that we use in our pipeline for segmentation. And cell segmentation is an analysis technique that's used to identify cell boundaries and an image. And it's actually an essential step in our pipeline to be able to perform quantitative single cell analysis on your data. So once you've done the segmentation and generated a single cell mask or segmentation mask, it can be uploaded to your data analysis software of choice along with the original images that you've that we've generated and there are many open source software choices available in our pipeline that we train on and that we support we use a software called histocat there are commercial options available and these softwares will allow you to visualize and plot single data cluster your data into distinct cell populations gate on certain cell types and go back and look at the populations or gate on your original image so in summary, there are actually many analysis tools that you can use to analyze your data. And the one you choose ultimately depends on your specific research question. So again, your IMC FAS can support you in every step of our data analysis pipeline. So don't be shy to reach out to, ask, reach out to us and ask any questions that you may have, and we can help design a pipeline that's specific for your question. Great. Okay, one more question for you, Lindsay. For an IMC okay. experiment, um, for an IMC experiment, how many ROIs do you recommend per sample to capture the heterogeneity of the tissue? Okay. 
So this again depends on your tissue and your question. Generally, the results are not actually dependent on the number of ROIs acquired or the total area of the tissue imaged. It has been shown that the relationship between cells and their environment are consistent across the tissue sample. So if you choose an appropriate region to image, then your data will capture the heterogeneity of that tissue. However, so for example, if we're looking at the spatial distance between a certain cell type and let's just say a blood vessel, then it's imperative that a blood vessel is included in your ROI. So if it's not included in your ROI, then it's going to be very challenging for you to answer that question where you're trying to look at that cell type in relation to that blood vessel. And so you'll have to go back and choose additional ROIs and acquire more data in order to answer that question. So a more important, I guess, than the number of ROIs is actually a proper understanding of your tissue and using the right markers in your panel and designing a panel that's properly, that will properly target the areas of interest and will address the question that you're trying to answer. So if you have questions about how best to optimize your tissue and how to optimize your ROI selection, then speak to an FAS and we can help not only with your panel design, but we can help you choose ROIs that are going to properly reflect the heterogeneity in your tissue. Okay, um, and then there's one question here for uh, mass cytometry. Um, can you label streptavidin with metal tags for tetramer detection? Um, so this is an interesting question. Um, so right now, so streptavidin um, in its native form doesn't have um, enough cysteine residues um, uh, that are available to uh, conjugate for metal tags to get a strong enough signal. Um, so one way um, to do this, uh, it, uh, so Evan Newell, who is at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, currently, um, he has, he's published um, a number of papers where he um, has an actual a, a mutant streptavidin. So it's a streptavidin that has um, extra um, cysteine residues, which, so he's able to, uh, you know, use our, um, our kits to uh, attach the tags to the um, streptavidin molecule. Um, and then he can use that mutant streptavidin for tetramer detection. So if, um, uh, we can have an FAS reach out to you and we can provide these references for you so that you could take a closer look um, or have more details about the method that he uses. Thanks, Connie. So that wraps up the questions. So if you want to learn more about imaging mass cytometry and how it can apply to your specific research, please schedule a one-on-one -on -one with a field application specialist via the email address that's appropriate for your location. And also please join us for these upcoming mass cytometry and imaging mass cytometry webinars. You can see the list and register at the fluidime.com events webpage. The website is listed on the bottom of the slide. And here we have one more on the topic of mass cytometry and imaging mass cytometry. For those of you following and attending our Friday FAS, we've spoken on five different vignettes. On July 10th, we were adding a new vignette called infectious disease. So all of these upcoming webinars, again, are listed on our fluidime.com events page. So please visit and register there. Thank you for attending the webinar today.